Dr. Jennifer Couch is the Chief of the Structural Biology and Molecular Applications Branch of the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health, where she leads programs in technology development, mathematical modeling, and data science within the National Cancer Institute, across the NIH, and in collaboration with many other agencies. She also co-leads the NIH Citizen Science Working Group, investigating the use of citizen science, including crowdsourcing, and advancing its incorporation in biomedical research while maintaining the very high standards of scientific and ethical properties of the NIH. Dr. Couch also co-leads the technology development implementation team for the Cancer Moonshot Initiative and the NCI Artificial Intelligence Working Group. She also participates in the trans-NIH and trans-agency efforts that bring outside perspectives to a variety of areas, including big data, single cell, interdisciplinary research, systems pharmacology, artificial intelligence, and interactive digital media, even game design. We look forward to hearing from her later today about engineering's role in the transition of therapeutic strategies. Um, well, thank you all for inviting me here today, and I, I'm happy to be here, not, you know, here, here, but I'd love to be there with you all in person, but circumstances and whatnot, so I'm happy to be here virtually. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity to uh, walk you all through a few examples, more or less in chronological order of, um, uh, of uh, some programs that we have in the physical sciences and cancer space. And I'm going to share my screen here. Let's see. Okay. All right. Hopefully you're seeing what I think you're seeing. Um, so I want to... Uh, described for you a few programs that we have in this intersection space between physical sciences and um, cancer research. And, um, and I'll take you sort of in chronological order through a couple of long-standing research programs and then up through some of our more um, emerging thinking and up-and-coming opportunities. Um, and those opportunities get at the effectiveness of bringing physical sciences approaches and thinking into cancer research. Um, cancer research is vast and complicated, and we need the skills and the insights and the creativity that come from all sorts of perspectives. And for me, that's where the um, physical sciences come in. So this first program, the Cancer Systems Biology Program, is, um, is a, a longstanding one. It's uh, one of our older programs, about 20 years old, and it's helped to launch the field of cancer systems biology by explicitly bringing together mathematicians and biologists, not just as um, you know, backups on each other's projects, but as true partners and collaborators um, rather than supporting players. Um, so this iterative cycle of experimental biology and um, uh, experiment, uh, experimental biology and mathematical modeling, hypothesizing and testing, creating sophisticated models, both um, mathematical and experimental, to gain a better understanding of key biological phenomena that underlie cancer initiation and progression. And it's a broad and open program um, that addresses lots of different mechanisms, but you can see here it, it current focus sort of falls into some of these main categories of um, thinking about uh, mechanisms for uh, issues like the tumor immune interaction, um, cancer heterogeneity, um, understanding the tumor as an evolving ecosystem, and um, issues of drug sensitivity and response, um, metastasis, and the impact of the cancer microenvironment um, on the developing tumor. The um, Physical Sciences and Oncology Network is the sort of younger sibling of the Cancer Systems Biology Program. It's uh, roughly 15 years old. And it brings the physical sciences perspective into cancer research. So again, not just as you know, tools and technologies from the physical sciences, but really as a way of thinking about cancer, um, the approaches and expertise from the physical sciences into the cancer research space. The Physical Sciences and Oncology Network also supports a range of different projects, and we leave it fairly open as long as it's got that physical science perspective. But they fall roughly into these kind of two big areas of um, the physical dynamics of cancer, um, mechanical cues, transport phenomena, signaling, um, molecular, chemical, mechanical signaling, that sort of thing. And then um, approaches to understanding the spatiotemporal organization and information transfer within cancer. So getting at, for example, the propagation of signaling across multiple biological scales and then emergent properties. So um, while both of these programs have as their core uh, uh, mandate the accomplishment of uh, cancer research, 
Um, we feel that the, um, again here that, oops, I'm sorry, I seem to have gone back here, juggling too many windows. Um, the core mission is research, but um, we feel like it's important to support education and outreach as well. Um, so that's outreach to other um, cancer research communities, other different kinds of communities, and then also outreach to um, uh, and, and education of the sort of the up and coming, you know, wherever the next uh, generation of cancer researchers and physical sciences and oncology network um, researchers are. So the project as a whole runs a wide range of different programs and the individual projects within the program run different programs and education and outreach. And you can see kind of a variety of them up here, including the um, mini dream challenge, which takes advantage of the um, the uh, methods and data that we use in data science challenges where a competitive sort of challenge prize mechanism is run around a biological question, for example. It's a fun way to teach kids coding and bring them into cancer research in a more relevant and interesting way. Um, and I'm sure that many of you in the audience know this way better than I do, but um, it can be really difficult for uh, more junior investigators, um, uh, postdocs, and, and people sort of at the beginning of their independent research careers, I mean, you know, kind of on that first grant, people that we're calling junior investigators here, um, to sort of extract themselves from their existing programs in, um, in their mentors' labs and move on to independent research careers. And I think that's harder for people that work in this interdisciplinary space where they're missing the collaborators and the resources. So this junior investigator meeting is run by, um, by the junior investigators and for them and organized for them um, and by them um, across three now of our different interdisciplinary programs, the Cancer Systems Biology Program, the Physical Sciences and Oncology Network, and now the um, BD STEP program, which is a newer bioinformatics um, data science program in the Cancer Institute. And the idea is that the junior investigators come together, build out their scientific network, share their science, but also um, have sessions on um, you know, career building and networking and um, dealing with careers in this interdisciplinary space. So um, one other aspect of the physical sciences and oncology network that we're now beginning to implement in several of our other basic cancer research programs um, that's a little bit unusual in the basic sciences is the inclusion of patient research patient research advocates. Um, the inclusion of advocates in cancer research isn't unusual in itself. Um, we include cancer research, uh, we include patient advocates in um, clinical research all the time, right, in trial design and um, recruitment strategies and that sort of thing. But embedding them in basic cancer research um, projects is a little bit of a different thing here. And here you can see by this long list, the advocates in these programs um, do a lot of different things in the different centers and projects. And they work across the programs as well to provide some um, needed context and um, presentation feedback, particularly to the trainees, the grad students and the postdocs. And we also work with the advocates to um, ask them to judge the posters at our PI meetings and hand out a People's Choice Award. So um, this is a really busy slide, but just to say that the, um, these consortia that I just mentioned aren't walled off. These are longstanding programs that um, support a number of different researchers, but we're also interested in bringing in people that are doing similar research funded in other ways. And so we have this opportunity to do um, associate memberships, right? People that are funded through other programs, joining the network and joining into the network activities. So um, an additional challenge that we have in the cancer research space is the challenge of um, you know, perturbing and um, testing hy biological hypotheses. And we know that animal models are not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Um, they, um, they have all the context that one would want or most of it um, for a cancer, right? They're, they're multidimensional and got the, um, often an immune system and they have a vasculature and that sort of thing. And so in that way, they're much more realistic. Um, they still don't model human cancers perfectly, but they're, they're close. But they're really difficult to control and manipulate and perturb. And on the other end of the scale are things like um, cell lines, which are very manipulable and easy to perturb, but um, they lose all of that contextual information. And so the biology is not well represented sometimes because um, cancer is a multidimensional system. So um, these biomimetic systems, the kind of things that we support here through the Tissue Engineering Collaborative are sort of the sweet spot in between those two extremes. They're designed with three-dimensional realistic um, settings. They include appropriate mechanical and chemical cues, for example, appropriate to the biological system that they're um, representing. 
Um, this is not a new area here, um, imaging in the biology space for sure, but um, it's a new consortium that we're launching. Um, and the idea here is to cover a gap. We have huge programs that support um, centers for things like um, cryo-EM um, on the one end of the imaging spectrum, and then things like um, clinical imaging on the other end of the imaging spectrum, MRI and PET and that sort of thing. But cancer researchers use and need better um, imaging methods um, in these scales that we're showing here across the molecular, subcellular, cellular, and tissue scales. Um, and this, so the idea of this program is to develop and adapt and integrate um, imaging methods. And I'm just kind of showing a variety of them up here, but you can imagine many more across this, um, these different scales and to begin to apply those in uh, what we're calling research test beds. So critical cancer questions that really can't be answered without um, these new imaging methods. And then to broaden that out to the larger research community. So switching gears here just a little bit, um, one area that we've been working on that is that um, cancer researchers, and I'm sure biomedical researchers in general, um, face really significant challenges in interacting with their very complicated and often multi-scale data sets. You know, how do they get at those aha moments when um, they can really sort of immerse and explore the data in, in an open-ended sort of way? And so we've been reaching out to communities that we don't traditionally support, um, communities like user experience and design from outside the biomedical research space, um, augmented and virtual reality, and then game design. And game designers and, and others, um, you know, make systems that are, you know, not just fun, but they're, um, they, they solve really complicated problems, data science problems that we have um, with cancer data. Um, the need to um, uh, save compute by rendering only the area that you're exploring at the time, for example, or um, creating collaborative environments where uh, people can collaborate in real time or um, creating environments that people can um, immerse in and, uh, and for sort of open exploration of the data for those aha moments. And so we've run a series of events where we've brought together people from those um, communities with uh, cancer researchers to do a variety of different activities to try and get at this um, intersection area. Um, but if we try to do sort of the obvious, which is just tell cancer researchers, go out there and find yourselves a game designer or a VR expert or something and partner up and apply for a grant, you know, you can imagine this is a challenge and it doesn't work all that well. Because um, these groups, not only can they not find each other, but when they do find each other, they don't know how to talk to each other. And it's it's not just the jargon, it's that the um, these, these different fields talk differently, they think differently, they approach problems and design solutions differently. And so to get at that, we ran a, a series of events here, um, which paired cancer researchers with people from way outside the field. And the one that you're seeing here by example is um, Tracy Fullerton, who's a game designer in the entertainment game industry, um, uh, designs uh, experiential games, things like Walden that you're seeing up here. Um, she's paired with Corey Painter, who's a cancer researcher and a patient advocate at the Broad Institute who runs programs like Count Me In. And they're, they're um, presenting their work a little bit to each other and then having a dialogue. Um, and then there's sort of a larger group discussion. And we have a whole series of those. And we've made those videos available just because they're really interesting and enlightening in, in terms of what we think games can do in this space. So those conversations and the subsequent activities around them led us to um, a couple of areas that we thought would be useful to take a deeper dive into um, in using what we call an innovation lab it's, or an ideas lab. It's an intense five-day collaboration building, kind of a sandbox. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the first of those focused on uh, what we call designing a better patient experience. And I'm showing you the set of um, expert mentors who provided guidance from their expertise areas across um, areas like patient advocacy and data visualization, game design, and clinical oncology. And they provided their expert advice to teams of new collaborators who met at the innovation lab, right? They didn't come with teams. They met their brand new form teams, came up with projects, and then sort of pitched and refined those projects with feedback from the mentors. And the idea is to kind of get them as teams close enough to be able to do things like apply for grant funding. Um, we're about to run a second one in this series, which is maybe a little bit closer to home for many of you in the audience today. Um, the idea of visualizing cancer data in context, um, getting at this sort of complexity and uh, multi-scale nature of cancer um, and, and cancer research questions. So we're using the same kind of method to uh, run a series of micro labs and other events around the idea of bridging cancer biology um, clinical research and um, advanced computing methods to more effectively model the complexity and combination of 
therapies and of combination therapies in cancer. And um, in cancer, uh, therapies are often um, provided simultaneously or sequentially in really complicated sequence um, or, or combinations in different patients for different kinds of cancers at different stages. And really understanding how those combinations work at a biological and clinical level is, is challenging. And so that's why we're running these um, uh, events in this area. And just kind of briefly to go over the overall goal here again is sort of the same. We're going to do this series of micro labs, and you can see we're kind of right in the middle of them. And the idea is to use those micro labs to hone in um, on some more um, areas that we think we can do a deeper dive into where there's a big opportunity. Um, and we'll run, you know, fingers crossed, an in-person innovation lab, and then um, on a topic. That, that comes falls out of these micro labs and then we'll build that back out to a larger what we're calling community of discovery and we're doing this in partnership with um, ibm research who's got an interest in this area and has built these communities of discovery before kind of building out the platforms and resources needed to bring a community um, together to collaborate around a space like this um, another area that we've begun to explore leverages basic science that we uh, that's usually supported by our partners at the National Science Foundation. Um, a topic like materials research, for example, or materials design. And while we support things like biomimetic systems, the materials that are used in those systems are often um, uh, not perfect and sometimes heterogeneous. Um, and so what we'd really like to see is better materials and maybe even living materials, right? Materials that act, um, you know, that sense and adapt and evolve and act like the living materials that we're trying to, to use the systems to model. And so we ran a series of what we call square tables and the square table is a metaphor for a four-sided table, right? And I'm showing you kind of three sides of that table here with the three chairs in the material science um, square table. Uh, this three sides being um, bio, uh, cancer biology and then biomaterials and then synthetic and systems biology. And the fourth side of the table being, you know, us, the, the um, federal agencies. Um, this just shows the last two square tables that we're running around a couple of other topics um, in, in a, the similar intersection between the basic um, science that NSF supports and the, base, and the cancer biology that we support at the NCI. Um, the topics are around emergent properties, um, bringing in sort of mathematics and physics approaches that drive understanding of, um, you know, a better understanding of cancer biology, and then bringing some of the imaging methods and the analysis methods that come along with them from areas like astronomy and things into the cancer research space around this challenging multi-scale imaging um, area that we have in cancer as well. Um, and we'll have some white papers coming out soon and, you know, likely some opportunities in that space. And I think with that, I'm gonna end and I'll stop screen sharing here. Jennifer, thank you so much uh, for those uh, insights and uh, in covering such a broad field of, of activities within the NCI. I'm wondering if you can hear us. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm struggling sorry. with this. Stop, Stop the screen, screen share. share. No, fantastic. I'm glad that we're not having uh, audio problems since we had them in previous <laughs> sessions. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, so some questions will be coming in from the uh, the internet audience, and I'll start with a couple of my own here, but to, to get things rolling. But so you've you've mentioned using physical sciences approaches to explore and elucidate mechanisms in cancer. So I, I wonder if you could comment on on the institute's uh, focus or on on using physical science and engineering approaches to develop new therapeutics. Uh, so sort of to combine with uh, with mechanistic understanding. Yeah, well, um, uh, one of the areas that I think is going to be exciting coming out of those um, combination therapies, uh, micro labs, for example, is that the idea of really bringing a better mechanistic understanding into the development of not just the development of new therapeutics, but the development of new therapeutic strategies, right? How we use those more effectively and more precisely in different patient populations. And, you know, we support a lot of um, mathematical, computational, artificial intelligence kind of models um, that look at the effectiveness of therapies and, and also that use um, those methods to design better, better therapeutic strategies and also better um, sort of you know, new um, 
oh, you know, new um, targeted molecular approaches and that sort of thing. But uh, often those are, those are done either sort of correlative, correlatively at the clinical level or um, there's basic biological studies going on. And we, we don't really sometimes see that um, translation from the, what goes on at the biological understanding of the biological mechanism level up into um, those, those clinical um, strategies. And so the idea is really to bring those together um, in, a, in a more effective way. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, with regard to the mechanistic understanding, so where uh, physical scientists and engineers are involved in developing tools like you mentioned, organotypic culture systems and, and, and uh, uh, in vitro modeling. But uh, so I wonder if you could comment on priorities of, on the one hand, tool development per se, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, uh, tool development plus, meaning and at the very same time, mechanistic understanding development. Sometimes one sees publications of tools that merely confirm what we already knew. Uh, and, and other times you see more exciting publications of tools that really show something that couldn't have been figured out without having that tool available and they had to invent that tool first. But can you comment on that spectrum from development of a tool sort of absent a hypothesis to development of a tool to elaborate a hypothesis? Yeah, it's a tricky balance, right? Because one of the things that I think cancer researchers and others are really effective at is repurposing tools that were developed for something else. Um, you know, repurposing a tool that was designed to answer a different question and kind of adapting that to answer their own questions. And in that case, it's, I don't want to say serendipitous, right? But it's if, if that tool had not been developed um, outside the cancer research space, we wouldn't have it. Um, that said, the, the programs that we support for the most part, um, support the, the other version that you describe, which is the development, you know, sort of there's, there's a need to do something, there's something we can't do, there's something we can't measure, there's something we can't understand. Um, and so we support programs, um, for example, we have a longstanding um, innovative molecular analysis and cellular analysis technologies program that supports a wide range of technology development. Um, but those are always kind of informed by some kind of, uh, um, you know, a cancer research space that they're trying to address. And then programs like this new imaging program is really trying to do both, you know, kind of iteratively go back and forth between the research questions and the tool development or the tool adaptation and integration. But I think there's room for all of that, right? There's room for brand new innovations in um, technologies that really get at measuring things that maybe we hadn't even imagined we could measure. And then there's definitely room for adapting those and bringing those in and, and refining them in a way that, um, that gets us towards answering much more specific questions in the cancer research space. And so most of our programs support these, is support things in partnership, partnership of cancer researchers or clinicians and, um, and the tool developers so that the tool developed answers the right question, if you will. Thanks so much. A question from an online listener, and this will probably bring us to uh, the end of our time allotment, but is it ex it's exciting to see educational outreach and patients being brought to the table with the researchers. And the questioner is wondering how the NCI manages all the stakeholders and aligns the incentives, that it seems like a really a colossal national scale community building exercise. And how does one, how does one lead that exercise? Yeah, well, that's a giant question to end on. So, um, you know, I, I think um, I probably should have said this at the beginning, but, you know, I'm coming at this presentation and, and where I'm coming from is sort of the very basic science end of cancer um, research, right? I, I support these kind of very enabling programs in um, understanding basic mechanisms. The NCI supports research across the entire spectrum, everything from, um, you know, technology development up through basic science and clinical and translational research and risk assessment and population science and behavioral research. Um, and so that's a big balancing act in itself. You can imagine um, that, you know, without basic science, there's nothing to translate into the clinic. Um, but without translating into the clinic, we don't see that impact. And without, you know, the feedback from what we know at the population scale to be occurring across um, populations and the heterogeneity that that brings. And, issues of um, differences in healthcare access and um, um, different populations and the, um, the, the, the different responses they have to different um, treatments and, and access and all of these things kind of play into our decision making. Um, but uh, that, so that's a multi 
layered process that we have thinking about all those different areas. But in terms of bringing in education and um, patients into the mix, um, <clears throat> like I said, that's sort of a common thing that we do in the clinical space. It's a lot less common in the basic biology space, but we thought it was really important. And the trainees in particular, the grad students and the postdocs seem to really appreciate, you know, building that context and um, being able to present their work in um, the context of how it really impacts um, cancer patients down the road. And the cancer patients um, act as our um, outreach to the community, sort of um, making sure that the, the broader community understands that basic science is also important here. Again, otherwise there wouldn't be anything to translate down the road. Fantastic. We really appreciate your time and, and insights uh, with us uh, that you shared this morning uh, and uh, uh, wish you well.